All right. Okay. Hello again, Dr. Abraham. So we have talked about the the Palestine the Palestinian cause, and uh, but right now we want to shift a little bit about Lebanon. You have worked in Lebanon, and you have like um, a very good like experience in um, there about the Orient and um, and that. So. Uh, with us right now is Alan. He's a representative of Mumfit. He's um, a Motanun and Motanat in Dawlat Party. And they are making like um, a new um, a new vision for, for the future for Lebanon. So I want Alan right now to, to elaborate for us. Uh, what is your new vision in, in Mumfit? Okay. So um, first of all, thank you for the discussion. It's very interesting. Um, I'd like to point out that we are a party that is in Lebanon, but that the political proposal that we are making is not limited to Lebanon or even to the Middle East. Um, there is a um, um, colonial model of a nation state uh, that was mentioned. And basically, this model views states as... Um, a weapon of war in defense of a certain identity against other identities. And we've seen this model, for example, with the state of Israel that claims to be a state for Jews. Uh, and, you know, the ongoing discrimination between Jews and non-Jews in terms of land allotment, uh, um, ethnic cleansing, uh, denial of the right of return, and others. But, you know, Israel is not the, the only case. Uh, the, the whole colonial enterprise for hundreds of years have, has been about exporting this identitarian model. Instead, uh, what uh, citizens in a state are proposing is something that could be called post-colonial, but, you know, without giving it fancy names. Um, our vision of a state, first of all, our vision of identity is that it is not something to be politicized. Uh, my identity or the identity of me and other persons is the way we choose to define ourselves. It could be based on our religion, our ethnicity, our culture, our beliefs, our values, whatever we choose to identify ourselves as. This, this identity is does not give me any rights or privileges, so it has no uh, political weight. It's my personal identity or our collective identity if we choose to identify this way collectively. On the other hand, a state, since identity is not politicized, is not there for identities. Mm. Um, a state is an apparatus that manages society in a certain territory according to society's real, actual, material needs, not their, you know, imagined uh, not, not the imagined is an Arabic word, not according to social constructs such as identity. Uh, now, in Lebanon, we're proposing a transition from the state we have, which is kind of an agglomeration of identities. So in Lebanon, the system, the regime does not view us as citizens, but as groups. So we have the Maronites, the Druze, the Sunni, the Shia, and this the regime is saying, let's do something new and have a state for all these identities. This has not worked because, again, a state is an apparatus that manages society according to its real needs. What ended up happening is that we have institutionalized uh, really what are tribes. So to give a practical example, in Lebanon, we have... Um, uh, the state electricity and we have private enterprises they work together and you know in a normal state we would have some kind of uh, well in a state we would have a decision is is electricity privatized or is it nationalized and if it's not that we, then the state would make a, dif a decision as to how to differentiate between the two what happens is that we barely have any electricity from the state electricity. We have like 10 hours of electricity a day uh, for, um, from private enterprises. 
So for example, Muhammad, you were asking me if we could meet today at four. Well, the electricity only comes at five. This is why I told you I couldn't be four, although I was, I was free. Mm -hmm. And the state cannot take a decision because by taking a decision, it will necessarily um, side with class interests, uh, with uh, interest groups against other interest groups. So for example, if it decides that we must do so, so and so, for example, they decide to nationalize electricity. Well, in that case, the private enterprise people, their families, their children, the people who sell uh, engines, the people who repair the engines, the people who, the oil cartels who buy oil, the people who transport the fuel, all of these people will be hurt. Now, a state can take such a decision and side with an interest group against another. But the problem is that when we behave as tribes, and I am the leader of my identitarian group, so I am the leader of the Maronites, for example, my legitimacy is that I represent the Maronites. And I cannot take a decision that will hurt Maronite people. The end result is that they take zero decisions because they are aligned on social constructs rather than actual interests. So we have both national electricity, private electricity, but no electricity. <laughs> but the good news, the very good news, we'll be very happy to know that inside the national company, we have 50% of Muslims and 50% of Christians. <laughs> that's all like that counts, you know, so that there's equal number of jobs distributed. Yes. This, this <laughs> is how tribes function. Yeah. This is why we fundamentally cannot politicize identity. If you're a Maronite, be a Maronite. Now I'm looking for an engineer, you know, to, to, to produce electricity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Uh, I should tell you what uh, my experience in Lebanon was in 1980 when I was invited there to the PLO conference. And uh, we traveled around the, the country to some extent and we visited, you know, the PLO fighters in uh, West Beirut. Uh, they even had artillery. It was incredible. And uh, we went so far south as Sidon. But at that point, after two weeks, a bomb went off in Sidon, and so we were told by our guides that uh, this was be the beginning of the civil war and that we would have to go back to Beirut and leave Lebanon. And it, it did. It started. And then it culminated in the massacre of Sabr Shatila, which I had visited myself. I was invited to, we were invited to a wedding there, a beautiful garden in the back of a little house in the Sabr Shatila camp. And then the uh, massacre took place. Uh, because the United States betrayed the PLO, basically. There was supposed to be an agreement in which the U.S. would guarantee that there would be no reprisals against the Palestinian refugee camps. And yet the United States, you know, uh, did nothing to stop. Uh, well, the, basically, you know, uh, General Sharon, you know, took over control of uh, all of Beirut, you know, from the United States and wouldn't, uh, wouldn't uh, listen to anything, I suppose, and had his uh, allies there. And they planned it all. I have it documented in my book on Sabra Shatila. And you go to a cafe, you know, and plan the massacre with the Maronites and the Phalanges. Phalanges in, in first instance, um, Hubeki in particular. Uh, not all the Maronites were Phalanges, of course. But uh, that's what I experienced there. And in the meeting with Arafat, that's important to tell you. Uh, we had a big uh, problem between us. Uh, because uh, uh, at first, you know, Arafat was very happy to see me and he knew the work that I had been doing in Toronto, you know, because he, you know, I showed him the pamphlet that, a, a brochure that, you know, we produced there for the Alliance of Non-Zionist Jews with an image of a dove, you know, uh, breaking free of, uh, of the map of Israel uh, and uh, breaking a chain that was, uh, and with the star of, David around its neck, breaking free from Israel. This kind of an idea, you know, breaking the Jewish identity free from the uh, Zionist state. He liked that. So I thought he would understand, you know, you know where I was coming from. And so, and then he says to me, do you have a question? You know, like that, he says, you know, do you have a question? So, you know, I'm thinking quickly, you know, I think what's the best, you know, question I could ask Yasser Arafat, you know, that would be helpful, useful, you know, something that I could take back. And tell people, you know, so I said, you know, do you have a message for the Jewish people? Ah, 
at the mention of the words Jewish people, he exploded, literally exploded and shouted at me, you know, coming, you know, face to face, you know, like coming to me, you know, like he was going to headbutt me, you know, shouting at me, no. I said, boy, <laughs> oh boy, I have done something wrong here. <laughs> I didn't even know what I was, <clears throat> what was wrong, you know, it didn't explain anything to me. You know, he was, this is, you know, his habitual, you know, conduct. He used to yell at a lot of people, not just me. <laughs> so I just, you know, shut up, didn't say anything anymore, and passed, you know, and asked the next person to start talking. So as everybody was leaving, you know, like I, 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 I waited, you know, for everybody to leave, you know, I, um, you know, from afar, and as if, you know, like we, we could, uh, you know, settle, you know, our different, you know, and talk personally. But no, he was still so all of a sudden this happy face, you know, to everybody else, you know, turned into a very angry face, you know, when he looked at me. But two years later in 1982, I think he asked for me to come and work at the Palestine Embassy and the ambassador called me up and I left my teaching at York University and uh, did, a, you know, three years of a lot of writing you know, every day, you know, writing letters, you know, documents. Uh, and then the book, you know, Sabra Shatila emerged, you know, started off as supposed to be, you know, five pages, then a 30 page essay turned into 118 pages of documentation that came in from so many different sources. And I put it all together. And we didn't have computers at that time, you know, so each edition, you know, each modification of the manuscript had to retype, you know, for on a, a typewriter, manual typewriter. And then the big breakthrough was an electric typewriter that I got. <laughs> <laughs> but before that, it was an Underwood, you know, the black ones, you know, with the big round, you know, keys. That's what it was uh, starting out. Uh, and uh, so Lebanon, uh, it was so interesting to see the PLO in full military force there. And, uh, and they couldn't be touched. And then, so that's why um, the, I guess the, the phalanges called in Israel you know, to back them up and because they planned, you know, to uh, start a civil war. And they knew that they would need the backup of Israel. It's uh, in incredibly, you know, corrupt, inhuman, inhumane. Yeah, yeah but um, by the way, also we can, we, we have many things to criticize the PLO about, about what they have done in Lebanon. Yeah. Uh, actually, I, um, uh, Many of my friends, the, the Lebanese friends, told me that even the PLO, okay, okay the, the plan just, of course, they were terrorists, but uh, the PLO itself had had really very negative impact on Lebanon. Uh, so how do you see it, Alan? How do you see the impact of the PLO on Lebanon? Now, the, the PLO is not one, uh, you know, we call it the PLO, but it was really made of several uh, political factions. And even each of these political factions was not united. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't really think it's fair to speak of the PLO as one single entity. Um, you know, it, it's like saying the Lebanese, you know because mm. the PLO was really all Palestinian political or all virtually all political Palestinian political parties. So it's like saying, what do you think of Lebanese political parties? You know, there are dozens and, you know, so uh, the, the, the main issue, in my opinion, is again, the tribal arrangement in Lebanon and the absence of a state. Because when you have uh, something like what happened in Palestine happening at your border, you have a Zionist project that politicizes identity, that segregates on its basis. And when we are already a society that is plagued with sectarianism, then you know the state has to make a decision. Mm -hmm. How do we deal with the Zionist threat? Do we perceive it as a threat or not? Do we fight it or not? If we do fight it, do we fight it militarily or through other means? If we don't fight it, what do we do then with the Palestinians? You know, these are decisions to make. So we didn't have a state. What happened is that they took no decision, you know, just like the example I gave you about the electricity. Uh, the Christian bourgeoisie agreed with the Muslim bourgeoisie that they would let the Palestinians fight, you know, down there in the south. 
while we keep making money here in Beirut. <laughs> so, you know, a normal state would make a decision. The Israelis and the Palestinians are fighting. Either Israel is my enemy, I have an army that's ready to fight, and I use the Palestinians as soldiers in my army, you know, not as a separate army of their own. Or I consider that Israel is not a threat, and then I consider that these people are the threat, and I use my army to fight the Palestinians. But they took neither decision. So again, the the tribal arrangement takes no decision. So I don't start by blaming the P, P, the PLO. I start by blaming the system in the absence of a state. Uh, you know, it's you could compare it to, um, you know, someone who has AIDS. And so they have uh, their their immune system is deficient. And, you know, maybe if they just, you know, catch the smallest cold, then they will die. Oh. So, yeah, the cold is bad. They're, you know, it's a virus and everything. But, you know, it's not the cold that killed you. It's the it's it's the immunodeficiency in the absence yeah. of a state we are vulnerable. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but also yeah, I mean, the PLO itself. Um, they, they have been like they didn't have any strategy any clear strategy when i read to yasser arafat or what he or what, what the books are about him they wanted like i want to say solution for jews and arabs and, and all of that but in the same time they have been like what had what they have done in, in lebanon in the in, in south Lebanon. H how do you see it um my Palestine, my lebanese friends uh, have told me that um, yeah, the the PLO in many cases were they had many like um, cr cr criminal uh, attitudes against the um, against the Lebanese. Is that right? And in the same time, of course, I'm not like um, I'm saying that the all of PLO was bad. But they weren't. But in the same time, how can we like? criticize its uh, its impact on on, on, on Lebanon itself. Um, for, from my point of view, I, I think that the, the best place where, sh where we should have put uh, the PLO was in Egypt, in Sinai. It was not in Jordan, near Lebanon, because Sinai, as you know, it is a desert, and it will not make any any demographic challenges or anything like that. Um, but I, but I don't know why all of that would happen. Why the PLO um, made that, made what they want, what they had did in Lebanon. Okay, the the, the tribal system in Lebanon, of course, uh, they screwed things up, and it was the the main cause of the disease. But in the same time, how can we, how how can we as uh, as a communist, as a socialist, criticize this experience and try to make something better, something that will learn from our past and not trying to, to, to like make everything go on each other and fight each other. Because, because at the end, the, 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 the PLO didn't fight, they did fight the, um, the Israeli army and they were very, very brave, especially in, uh, in, uh, in, um, Al-Katiba Tullabiyya, the students, uh, they, they were really brave, uh, brave guys. But uh, as in politics, how can we criticize this experience to try to make a useful lesson for, for the future at least? I think that the... I'm sorry, are you asking me? Yeah. Okay. Now, both of you. Since, hey. since, okay. Um... I think that the main lesson to be learned is mm -hmm. in the absence of a political program, you are bound to get lost. Uh, you know, the, the, the English saying, if you don't know where you're going, then it doesn't matter which way you choose. So there was no clear political agenda and uh, resistance. Now, today it's even worse. Resistance had become... Um, idolized mm -hmm. to the point that it became a, an, an end in itself. So to be a fidei, to be a resistance, 
a resistant. Uh, it became uh, almost a job, you know, almost a role. What do you do? I'm a fidai. Instead of it being just a means, a way to achieve an end. So there was no clear political vision about forcing a transition from an ethnocracy to a democracy in Palestine. Mm -hmm. There were ambiguous words about, you know, liberation. And the fact that these words were ambiguous uh, made the Oslo Accords possible because, you know, we're still talking about liberation, but now it's the liberation of part of 22% of the land. Uh, but we will have East Jerusalem. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, this is what happens when we have no clear vision. When there is a clear vision, then, you know, decisions can be made, questions can be asked, like, where are we heading? Why did you take this decision? The same is true today. So to give an example, today, um, the main uh, debate between Hamas and Fatah will be Hamas saying, uh, you should resist. Instead, you're using your weapons against the Palestinian people. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other will counter by talking about, you know, some kind of freedom they have in the West Bank, but they, those, the others don't have in Gaza, which is pointless. Both, both points are pointless. Um, Especially for Fatah. Yes, but really, e even for Hamas, yani, uh, I'm, I don't mean to demean the, the act of resistance, but mm -hmm. let me give an example as to what's happening. Uh, a few months ago, the, um, the Israelis assassinated the Palestinian Islamic Jihad leader in the West Bank, and then the Islamic Jihad attacked uh, Israeli targets in occupied Palestine, in retaliation for the assassination of their commander. Mm -hmm. Now, when you look at it, this looks like resistance. But when I look at it, what I view is normalization. Because basically they're saying, it's fine if there is a Zionist state. You know, the concept of a state for Jews is fine. But just don't, don't do anything bad. And we're only retaliating for his assassination. This is a kind of normalization. This means... I'm not countering the Jewish legitimacy of the state. I'm fine with it. I just don't want them to do crimes. This is actually very dangerous because it it depoliticizes the um, it depoliticizes the the whole struggle. You know, if you're if you're fighting because they assassinated one of your leaders, you know, I think more Islamic jihad. Um, uh, people died from car accidents than from Israeli assassinations. This is really not the reason why we wage a war. Yeah. I, I have an evaluation of Hamas which is uh, more favorable uh, in that <clears throat> you know, Hamas uh, in 2017 changed its charter, the original charter of 1988 it was written by one person and just, you know, I <clears throat> copied all the cliches that had been, you know, part of the oral tradition previously. It wasn't really a document, you know, made by a movement. But this document, 2017, was and removed the references to Jewish people as the um, threat and as the target and uh, began to use the ideological definition of Zionism instead. And also, agreed to a uh, even agreed to the recognition of the of the Israel state if Israel state recognized Palestine in a reciprocal manner and, though, and therefore exposed you know the Fatah leadership for having recognized Israel without receiving recognition in return and therefore leading to the whole sort of impasse now and to the colonization of the West Bank so I think Hamas's uh, political strategy is something it does have a political strategy they do uh work uh, in the international diplomatic sphere by way of a fatah only so all the ambassadors are fatah i worked with the fatah ambassador in ottawa uh, dr abdullah abdullah now and uh but hamas you know recognizes that uh, fatah has a certain specialty in that way and they speak you know the spokesperson you know for the palestinian nation in the international arena, even though they consider that it's necessary to contest the Fatah party, you know, leadership within Palestine. But 
since that produced an impasse as well, they've made a further step, <clears throat> I think, which is beneficial in that they have a, a united front now with Fatah, which was declared in uh, Algeria recently. And, and they did, you know, some photo ops, you know, I don't know what they achieved more than, you know, some photo ops, but uh, nonetheless, you know, it started a process there that uh, I think will at least, at the very least, avoid a Palestinian civil war like occurred in Gaza in 2000, what was it? 2005? Yeah. 2005, yeah. So, but, so, you know, so much is happening, nonetheless, you know, despite all the impasse, you know, uh, Palestine was the first Arab country to have an election, I understand. And then uh, it was uh, Tunisia that followed. So Palestine is like an inspiration to the Arab world. I think Palestine, you know, can actually be the, the motor force that will generate, you know, a pan-Arabist, you know, revolution that fi finally will destroy the uh, nation state system. And then the Arab League will become, you know, something other than a, a collection of kings in the uh, Marcus system. But uh, it's still very difficult, you know, and internally, I will tell you, you know, from the work uh, inside Nablus, one great, you know, uh, achievement was uh, the formation of a United Front resistance movement there, but at a very low level, level I would say. Uh, but is nonetheless, you know, not in front of all the uh, political tendencies. So, and it's called the um, Popular Resistance Committees. I worked with them as well. We go out and to do demonstrations, you know, both within Nablus and outside. Nablus, you know, in the Jordan Valley, we had an alliance with the Jordan Valley resistance, civil resistance uh, movement there, and we'd go out there to, to help them. And, all to, and, and we would also go to all the villages around Nablus and to stop them, to help them, you know, to stop the, um, the military from coming into the villages when they would have a demonstration every Friday after the mosque. So the popular resistance committees are united front already, but they have no, uh, they had no military strategy. The same thing has now become translated into the uh, lion's uh, uh, brigades that started in Janine and now Nablus. And they are also united uh, uh, popular resistance committees, but in the military as a military unit. But, you know, political parties means nothing there. You know, they have uh, members, you know, of uh, both the, the brigades and the popular resistance committees in civil resistance that are uh, uh, of, of, uh, of all the political parties. I mean, people don't even talk about political parties anymore. They don't identify as being as a member or representative of any political party. They just, you know, uh, represent a region, you know, a territory or a village, and, you know, because that's more important than the political party representation. Now, I had uh, started to formulate a strategy of resistance that went beyond uh, the civil resistance, you know, that they were engaged in. But uh, that's a very difficult topic. And, uh, oh, now we're running out of time as well. But uh, uh, we didn't record this because this is more of an internal discussion. So um, I will... Uh, um, finish uh, formatting the uh, original, you know, video that we made, you know, when we're talking about Zionism, and I'll put it up, and I'll send you the link for it so that you can share it, and then we can uh, plan for a further meeting at another time. Thank okay. you very much for this hearing, and I'm very glad to meet you, Elaine. Good evening. I'm very glad to, like, gather all you <laughs> to talk to each other. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great group. Yeah, it's because of you. Thank you, Mohammed. Okay. You're welcome. Okay. Okay. Have a any good day. any endings or anything? Any anything you want to say, Alan? Not from my side, no. Okay. Neither me. Okay. In my own okay. language, I would say in Yiddish, I would say "Kaimel nish nochamol," which means "never again." I all I only speak German. <laughs> No, that's more Yiddish than German. That's real Yiddish. Which means? It means Which never means? never again. Never again. Okay. Never again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good night. Okay. Good night.